this is what we think should be the next priority for the next administration coming in. Um, whether or not our transition memos are read is not up to us. So we'll see about that. The second point, engaging uh, communities directly is very, very important. And I think that what we want to do as much as possible is, if we're going to do something with mayors, we also, it's not just the White House and the mayors working together, it's White House, mayors, and the Muslim community working together. So any resources we come up with have to have the, imp the imprint and the authorization of both the mayors themselves and also the Muslim community themselves. Because what's the point of coming up with a toolkit that nobody actually like saw or nobody actually, actually cares about? So that's very important to us. The other thing is, I absolutely want to make sure, now more than ever, that our Muslim communities on the ground level know just what resources are available to them. It's very, very important. Um, and so, right after the election, so twice from now we've done this. After, around Eid al-Adha, when there was a lot of concern that there would be an uptick in attacks against Muslim communities around the country, and also right after the election, we did this thing where we sent out a, a toolkit for Muslim communities. We called it uh, uh, Resources for Protecting Our Communities. And essentially what it was was just a list of different resources that different federal agencies offer. So that if you, uh, if you are experiencing a hate crime, or you know somebody who's experienced a hate crime, oftentimes we don't even know what to do when that happens. And so we created a worksheet that tells you if you, if you experience a hate crime, or somebody you know experiences a hate crime, this is what you do, this is who you talk to. You report it both to local law enforcement and to federal law enforcement. If you're a student, or you know, or your child has experienced bullying or harassment or a hate crime in a school setting, there's actually a different process that you go through. So a lot of people don't know this, but the Department of Education has an Office of Civil Rights. And they have a <coughs> of Civil Rights regional offices all around the country. So no matter where you live, there's actually, the Department of Education has its own Office of Civil Rights within your own community. And so if you experience issues of bullying or harassment, your student or your kid does, or your student and you experience that, you actually have recourse. You can actually take it up with the Department of Education to defend your rights and defend uh, and to and to make action actually happen. Because sometimes what happens is there's these cases of bullying or harassment of kids, and the local administrator at that school will just kind of like look the other way. Or say like, oh, this isn't a big issue. Sometimes it's not even students bullying students. Sometimes it's teachers bullying students. Mm -hmm. And that's an even bigger situation where you know no public school administrator is going to want to touch that and want to get involved in something that seems like that, you know, sticky of a situation. I want people to know that even in those situations, you do have advocates. You do have resources available to you for confronting those issues. So, it's a big, uh, another, one, one more example. The Department of Homeland Security, which has many different offices and departments and programs. One of the programs the Department of Homeland Security offers is any house of worship that is concerned about um, its ability to withstand attacks and uh, arson and things like that. Family and Homeland Security offers a free service where we'll come to your house of worship and assess kind of where your gaps might be in security. And they'll help you beef up your security. Um, it's a free service that Family Security offers. And I encourage mosques around the country to take them up on that because we've seen a lot of the targets of hate have been our mosques or houses of worship themselves. There's been instances of arson, there's been like people literally shooting firearms into mosques. Uh, again, in that situation, there are resources that are available to communities for, uh, for protecting themselves. So, we will do our best to make sure those resources are put together in one place. We'll do our best to make sure that the community has access to those. Um, one more thing is, I hesitate to talk about it because I'm not sure that we're going to see it released, but we are working on a one-stop shop for hate crimes. It's going to be a website that any person who experiences any kind of issue of hate crime or discrimination can go to this one website and they'll have the resources available to them right there in plain English of what they can do and who to contact in federal government. <coughs> because this is also another important thing to keep in mind. Is yes, the administration is going to change. Yes, people like me will be out of a job. But at the same time, there are so many federal agencies that are under the federal government whose majority of their employees are not going to change, are going to stay there, including people like Rahima. Which means that there are folks who are involved right now on civil rights issues all across the federal government who care passionately about civil, uh, protecting civil rights, defending civil rights, and religious liberties. Those guys aren't going anywhere. They're still going to be in the federal government. They're still going to be allies. They're still going to be there to look out for you. And one of my jobs now is to make sure that folks in the community know that those people exist and to make those connections while we still have time. Because I want you to understand, again, that 
yes, there's a change in administration. Yes, the new administration might have different attitudes towards different topics. It does not mean that the entire federal government and all its agencies will be on the same page with that. Um, I guess I'll leave it there. Um, hi, my, my name is Ellie Rostrom, and um, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. The first is I study resentment in Muslim communities in the United States, and I will be very intrigued to hear from both of you on sort of the sources of resentment, and especially in, you know, I grew up in a post 9 11 world in the United States, so my first encounter with my faith was somebody vilifying it or attacking me. So. I came to learn about Islam through figuring out, okay, well, let me figure out why he's pissed at me. Uh, so it would be, I, I wonder what the experience is for a generation of Muslims um, who are sort of teenagers now, and whether they sort of either deny or their faith or sort of let it go on the wayside, or uh, maybe become even more, study Islam and, and decide for themselves, or even be radicalized, which is the... A concern now. So that was my first question. My second question, and it's interesting just to see between the two of you, you represent a lot of America, a lot of Muslim America, and, and it, sort of the maybe obstacles, but also the opportunities in bridging sort of sometimes, it, like you said, it's a the Muslim community is a bunch of communities, and sometimes we don't talk to each other, especially sort of like the immigrant Muslim community, yeah. or, or many decades immigrant, and the African American, like as American as you get in the Muslim community in the United States? Um, so, interestingly enough, I, I haven't had a chance to read the study. Um, it was just sent to me last night, so I only read the highlights. But I, I know that there's, a, there's an organization. There's actually a professor who's working on like, a, a Muslim doll study that is reminiscent of a study that was done um, back in like the 1960s, I think, that was basically um, the, the black-white doll study would kind of yeah. assess attitudes of young people and present it with dolls of different races. You know, who's the bad doll? We have two different dolls there. And um, I haven't had a chance to read the whole study yet, but it was basically trying to do the same thing to assess how Muslim young people are kind of internalizing some of the things that are going on by presenting them with, like, who's the bad doll, who's the good doll, and, you know, showing... I, I want to actually read the study because I want it'd be interesting to see what the dolls look like. Yes. It's just to me, I'm just trying to figure out like you know how they're gauging um, you know the study. But it, so that'll be interesting. I think that um, with respect to young people, I think it's going to it's incumbent upon all of us, people who are not so young anymore, like Zachy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, seriously, but but like you know, of all different generations, people who are in their 20s, or 30s, or 40s, 50s, and 60s. And, and older to really mentor um, young Muslims to make sure that young Muslims are who are growing up in this in this um, you know this current um, environment um, learn about their faith learn about the diversity of their faith look at us as as models of, of people who are Muslims who are working together who are working with each other as Muslims and also working with other communities um, I think that's what's going to be really instrumental for our children and really making sure that um, we're using the tools that are available to us to make sure that our children are protected, that they're not, they're not bullied in schools, that if they, are, if they encounter bullying, that we, that we address it. Um, so I think it's going to be incumbent upon us to do that type of work um, to make sure that you know, the children who are growing up now um, don't feel isolated, don't feel ashamed about their faith. Um, because you're right, like for me growing up, I, I grew up Muslim in, in Philadelphia. So it was a town that there was a, has a very strong, you know, Islamic presence. Um, even talking about the mayors, I mean, there was an incident, early, like a, I think happened uh, earlier this year or last year, where a man who was wearing a thobe, like, shot a police officer. And it would have been, you know, easy for, the, kind of like the people went to the mayor and said, you know, well, oh my gosh, look at that, you know, Muslim who shot that cop. And the, and the mayor was like, that's not Islam. Islam is about peace, and what that what that guy did is totally against what all the Muslims I know um, have done and would do. And Muslims I know they don't support that type of action. And they kept so then of course the mayor, you know, faced backlash of people putting him. They put like a fake fez on his head and put him in the newspaper. They're like he's the Muslim mayor, but he didn't back down because of the work that had been done with the Muslim community and the outreach they had done to that mayor in advance. So he knew when he was confronted with that situation, he said, that's a mental health issue. That guy who shot that cop is obviously crazy. He's not, you know, that, that's, that's not an indication of somebody doing something in the name of Islam. So I think that goes back to 
us being able to work with each other as Muslims and also outreaching to the larger community so that when incidents like that happen, we have allies who can speak on our behalf in, in times when it's difficult for us to speak. I would say just once again that because this is my 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 personal standpoint, at a time like this it is incumbent upon our houses of worship more than ever to make sure that they truly are safe spaces and truly inclusive spaces for all. Because what's gonna happen is if you have young people who are alienated by broader society and made to feel uncomfortable being Muslim, but then they come to their, their mosques and they're made to feel like they're not Muslim enough, or they don't belong, <laughs> or they're the wrong race, or they're the wrong gender, then where are they going to go? They'll be stuck in the middle. And yeah, and that is that is the worst possible situation scenario. So it is incumbent, of, of course, upon government to do more, all it can do to better engage the communities. It is incumbent upon, you know, our allies to fight hate when they meet it, but it's also incumbent upon our institutions themselves to evolve and to realize that you got to be a safe space. You have to be a space where, no matter who you are, if you say you're a Muslim, you're welcome. It can't just be something you say. It has to be shown in practice. Because too often that, that creates a situation where you have people who are stuck not feeling like they belong anywhere. And that is the worst possible scenario. Um, I want to mention something that uh, Rahima said that is very, very important. Um, justice, what Dr. King said, uh, injustice anywhere, there's injustice everywhere. So as Muslims, we can't just stand up for Muslim issues. Justice is justice. Anyone who's being treated without justice needs as much attention as the next person. It's not just Muslims. And I thought about the... Um, Native Indians in Standing Rock. There are Muslims down there protesting with them, supporting them. We have to support other people's issues. What we find in America is that they have taken Muslims and put them in a little package. And whether you call yourself Muslim American or American Muslim, you're still in the package. So everything around that package, it's just there. We have to get out of the package and become involved in all walks of American life. We have to be American. We can't be Asian American. We can't be whatever Muslim American you want to be. You have to be American and you have to stand up for all issues that affect all people. Once you start doing that, you blend into society and you become not a brand anymore. You become American, then you can be your Muslim. Jewish American were like that when they came, but they're not like that today. So all ethnic groups have to go through something, but you have to engage. You have to stand up. And what I find, I live in Fairfax County. I attend Juma in Loudoun County. And what I found amongst most of the Muslims there is fear. They're afraid that if they stand up, somehow or another, they're going to lose their American citizenship. They're not going to be able to go here. They're not going to be able to go there. They're just going to be caught in their homes. But that's not true. What is happening with the new presidency and all of these hate crimes SubhanAllah, Allah has allowed it to be that way. And I think, this is just my opinion, it's for us to wake up. Wake up and get in jail. Be American. Mm -hmm. And we have to spread that news to those folks who don't understand that this is why we're having the problem. Because we want to be separate. We're not separate. We're Americans. Let's be American. You know, I was born Christian. I was raised in a Jewish neighborhood. I have Jewish friends, Christian friends. Catholic, all kind of friends. But I never felt un-American. So we have to help our friends and neighbors and people in our community and our mosques to understand that they're separating themselves. Become American. Come together and let's be Muslim Americans along with all the other Americans and we'll find the strength that we need to engage. We'll, we won't engage as long as we have fear. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. This is what I was going to say. So get out there, step up, and say, hey, we're going to make a difference. And I think that's the message that many communities are missing, that we have to come together as Muslims, but more important, we have to come together as Americans. I don't know if I may respond to what the sister said. <laughs> Um, one of the things you were talking about, the fear, and see, as a Muslim for me, I'm going to speak for me, 
and this is my view based on what I believe that Muslims in general are missing. We're Muslim first. We're Muslim first. And so who are we supposed to satisfy? Allah. We have no we should have no fear of no one except Allah. And so therefore the idea of becoming of being American, to me, is ridiculous. Because if you really study American history, it's been evil all through the history of America. Okay? Here's the benefit. We are we, we are blessed to be Amer in in this country because of the Constitution. There's one part of that Constitution that gives us, gives me, uh, uh, opportunity. And that's freedom of religion. Okay? Because of that freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Okay? Meaning that we have the ability and opportunity to do what Allah uh, said through His Prophet to propagate Islam, to send a message to the people. Okay? So, was, and we, we're, we're a small group of people, Muslims in this country, compared to the whole country, right? So, opportunity. We have opportunity to do, let people know, because guess what? Islam is not a religion. Well, I'm speaking about this here in front of me. Religion is probably, you go to 